This is Barbara Slavin. I'm at the Morris Institute Library, and we're doing the Veterans Oral History Project. It's May 10, 1999, and we're interviewing James Smith. Uh, are you, uh, your marital status? I'm married 51 years. Mm -hmm. Do you have children? We had six children, and now I have 20 grandchildren. Great. Where were you born? I was born in Cincinnati, Ohio. 1920. And were you raised in Cincinnati? I was raised in Cincinnati. I went to Xavier University and uh, I left the university graduating and on the next next day we were on a train to an army post. <laughs> what was your family background? We were depression children. Mm -hmm. We were, uh, my sister and I were poor my father was out of work and tried to find jobs. It was, it was a tough, it was a tough go, and not many kids went to college back in those days. Mm -hmm. So the government came in with a program called the NYA, and the school would pay you fifty cents an hour, and you worked every hour you could at the college, and they never paid you, but it went towards your tuition. Of course, tuition was only $150, <laughs> so I got half of my tuition because I was poor enough, and I got through college. What did you major in? I majored in business. Great. What does NYA stand for, do you uh, remember? National Youth uh, Organization mm -hmm. or Association. You had to prove you were poor enough, though, to, mm -hmm. to get it. And you had to work a lot of hours at 50 cents an hour to make it, but I made it. Excellent. We ask when and where you entered the military. We, we, I, went, uh, I went right away to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and from there I went to artillery school at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And uh, when did you... Was, when did you enter at Fort Bragg? What year do you uh, think it was? 1942, May 1942. And how did you choose, happen to choose the Army? I, uh, the college had an ROTC program, mm -hmm. and I uh, was smart enough or lucky enough to sign up mm -hmm. way back when I was a freshman. And so, uh, as soon as we finished, uh, we went to school and became officers right away, so that's how it happened. Did your friends or family join the military? I was the first of all my cousins, yeah. cousins to go. And uh, when I think back, it, it was an exciting period of time. I didn't, uh, in my last year at college, I didn't care a thing about my grades. We, we knew that the big adventure was coming, and uh, we were all excited about it. Like I wrote, uh, we paraded around in our uniforms, and the girls all cheered, and we hadn't done a thing. <laughs> we hadn't done a thing, just uh, the service years. Mm -hmm. And when I first went in the Army, it was wonderful. Yeah. We had so much fun, <laughs> it was great. Well, what was basic training like? basic training, you, know, you got your uniform and things like that, but uh, you learn to be a soldier, like you went out on the, on the range and fired a gun. I never fired a gun in my life before that, and uh, it gave you some training in, the, in uh, gas, in the use of gas and gas mask, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of drills drill, marching up and down the field, really get you uh, so that you could be a soldier. Did you form any close friendships during basic training? Well, you, you, you met a lot of people who you liked and were friendly with, but the next day they're gone mm -hmm. and you never see them again. That's the way it went. Mm -hmm. Nothing was sure. And you weren't sure. You weren't sure that you were going to be there the next day either. 
What was your first uh, duty station? Oh. Well, after this artillery school, I was sent back to a re recruiting center. Now, we took soldiers that just literally just got off the bus, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, they uh, had about a three months course in their basic training. Mm -hmm. And I became a platoon, mm -hmm. uh, a, a battery officer. And I was just a second lieutenant, and uh, usually, usually the battery officer was a first lieutenant. Mm -hmm. But I had a in with the captain, and I got <laughs> my platoon, I called it. Yeah. It was great. And what does a platoon battery officer do? Well, they went through basic training, and I went with them. Mm -hmm. When we marched out on, uh, when we marched, I was their officer. When we went out on the range shooting, I was there to see that, you know, they behaved and uh, did their duties. I followed them around, mm -hmm. and uh, you know they were like I was theirs, and they were mine. Yeah. And then at the end of the training program, phew, they're all gone. How did your duties change throughout your military career? Oh, you know, as I said, we had a great time in the army in the beginning, but soon as it got on that ship, things changed. Mm -hmm. Going. I, I don't know why, but I never read any stories about a troop ship. Mm -hmm. Now, if, if you think about it, a troop ship, uh, seasickness. Ah! Hmm. Oh. Well, we were 12 days going across the Atlantic to North Africa, and the first eight days you could go out on the deck. Now you have about, uh, I don't know, a th thousand plus soldiers aboard the ship. And so there was a little problem going on decks, but we could get out of decks. But the last four days, you know, the ocean was rocky mm -hmm. and you couldn't go out. Oh, guys were so seasick. They were puking in everything conceivable. Mm -hmm. And some guys were so sick that, that I think if they didn't get them out of there, I don't know what would happen to them. They just uh, couldn't function. Well, we were glad to get off that ship. Well, that's the beginning of And where did you get off the ship? We got off at Casablanca. Oh. Ah, talk about exciting, though. Yeah. You look out of your ship and, and you see a, a city like you've never seen before. All these white stucco, it's, it's like those people never had any wood, yeah. and everything was a white stucco with a different kind of roof on it. And it seemed like, you know, as you look out across and see the, the city, it, the buildings were piled on top of one another. Yeah. Was it a pretty sight? Well, yeah, at first, till you got in there, yeah. and it wasn't so very pretty. I found uh, most of the cities were dirty and uh, a lot of, uh, like, like, like in North Africa, the f French, it was a French colony then, mm -hmm. so the French were separated and the natives lived in what they called the Casbah. Mm -hmm. Now the Casbah is one of these narrow little streets, you know. At first, we used to go in and go into a bar, and we'd be the only white person there. So before very long, they wouldn't allow us in the Casper anymore. But it was exciting to see something altogether different like that. Look out over the landscape and see camels, wow. where you would see cattle and horses. You see camels. Where where was um, what? What was the situation in Casablanca at the time that you landed yeah. there? We landed there uh, in, in February, and uh, what at, year? I'm at sorry. the front was '43 then. Okay. And at the f front up in Tunisia, mm -hmm. the Germans had broken through, mm -hmm. and the uh, news was bad. 
we, we had an idea when we got off the ship that we were going to, you know, go straight into fighting. Well, Casablanca is way over here and Tunisia is way over here. It took a little while to get us there, but they rushed us there. So what were your duties, what were you involved with, for example, when you were um, in Casablanca? Well, what was your we role were in at that a time? camp, mm -hmm. a big camp with mm -hmm. them. And the uh, uh, Arabs were working, the Arabs, we used to call them Arabs. Arabs. <laughs> you know, they, I, I often wondered why we weren't very friendly with them. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I figured out why. You know, the, the French controlled Morocco, and we were white, and so I think the Moroccans looked upon us as just another colonial people. So uh, I didn't, uh, I don't remember ever conversing or even try to converse. We, we, never, we never mistreated them. But we were never friendly. Like when we went into Italy, that was different. Mm. You know, they seemed to be people like us. And, and uh, they were in such a rush to get us from the camp. I was a replacement. Mm -hmm. You have no idea what a replacement was, was it? A replacement? I was there to replace a dead, right. a captured, are wounded, mm -hmm. and that's what we were there for. Right. So they put us on a train, and uh, it, the train was like going back 20, 30 years. I, I even was on a train, one of the, what they called a 40 and 8, and it just seemed like we got aboard this boxcar, and they had just pulled the sheep and the animals out. In other words, nobody would sit on that floor. <laughs> Where was the train? The train went from uh, Casablanca to Oran, and it went through. It went through deep tunnels, and it was hot aboard the train. So we uh, worked to get the windows open. You know, never realizing what was going to happen when we went into the tunnel. Yeah. The train is up front and it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, smoke coming out of the chimney. And so we went into the tunnel and when we got on the other side, we were all <laughs> sort of all over us. <laughs> but then at Oran, uh, really one of the scariest adventures I had up to that time, they, they took us down to Tunis, it's a mm -hmm. harbor, right. and you counted off one to 25, and 25 guys went aboard whatever was going up the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And I was put on a tanker. You have no idea what a tanker is. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a big, sh it's a ship loaded with gasoline. Now, when a, when a tanker is hit by the enemy, there is nothing left. I don't even think your eyebrow is left. You are just blown to pieces. And for two days and three days and two nights, we were on that floating tub going up the Mediterranean, and the Germans were on both sides. And uh, two airplanes came over and they circled around up there. There was about six of us, six tankers. And the captain of the little tanker was British. He said, everybody go below. You think I'm going to go below? <laughs> it wouldn't have made any difference if I was down below or up above. But nobody wants to just hide down there, so we wanted to all see. And those two planes circled around and dove, and they looked like they were headed for us, but they were headed for the tanker in front of us. Oh. And they missed. Oh. They, they, how could they conceivably miss? I don't know. 
But the answer is, those two German pilots wanted to survive too. Hmm. So they let their torpedoes go too early and they missed and we all <laughs> cheered and then they flew away as fast as they could. And then I got up to Tunis, Tunisia. Hmm. And then I was getting close to, and then you waited in a camp and waited in the camp until a list was posted mm -hmm. saying that you're going to a certain outfit and somebody else is going to another outfit. So what happened in Tunisia? Oh, I, I joined my unit, mm -hmm. the 17th Field Artillery. Right. They had been in World War I. Right. And now they were in World War II and they, they had been banged up. And that's why I was there. They lost. German tanks overran them. Mm -hmm. So I joined them. And, and you would think, you know, they, I joined the outfit. I sat down with their commanding officer, an old guy from World War I. And he gives me a big pep talk, you know. You're joining the 17th field, and I'm sitting on a cot. <laughs> and he's sitting on a cot next to me in a little bitty tent. Yeah. And he's telling me how great the history was mm -hmm. and that you go in there and keep up the good work. Okay, okay. You know, that rah-rah stuff yeah. don't work anymore. And then I was taken in the Jeep and I joined my unit. Well, I got down into the unit and you'd think that somebody would come out, you know, and welcome me, you know. Yeah. I, I think that my commanding officer, the captain, he looked down and he saw a little old me out there, you know. And maybe he thought the replacement was going to be some big, <laughs> tough guy. Yeah. And I had to scramble at first, climb aboard any, any one of the trucks. I, hmm. And then the truck start driving. And at night we would drive on the road and way up ahead I could see the flashes. Uh. And then uh, getting closer, I could hear the shells hitting. And then I finally became part of the unit. And then I uh, started, uh, was Holy Week of 1943. And they sent, they had the nerve to send me, and, and I had no previous experience, in fact, I had very little experience, period. Mm -hmm. Even back home in Cincinnati, <laughs> I was not a streetwise kid. Mm -hmm. And they sent me right up to the last hill. And, we, and I arrived, and the American soldiers were arriving, and the British were leaving. And this British officer, he, he said, hey, Lieutenant, there's a, there's a deep hole up there all ready for you. And I went up and it, the hole was so deep that I could walk up into the hole and my head would never appear mm -hmm. above the hill. So I was there 20 minutes and the Germans started the firing artillery at the hill. And it was one thing if they were aiming at the hill, but they weren't aiming at the hill. They were aiming at my hole. Mm. And I realized then that the, the Germans knew where that British officer was, and they knew that we were coming in. Mm. They knew the Americans were coming in. So they start shelling my hole. I learned, I was shelled a lot of times, and I learned, uh, I, I had a procedure like I went into. I would curl up in a fetal position, mm -hmm. I would double up my legs and arms, and I was going to protect my heart, and I'd protect my head. Mm. I had a regular little procedure I went through, and the shells landed very close. I was, I was hit by little pieces, but not strong enough to break the skin. That was my first experience. And so on Easter Sunday, uh, oh, during the night, the Germans must have known we were going to attack, mm -hmm. and they came over with an airplane, a real light, one of those light little airplanes mm -hmm. that flies real slow, 
and fly over the front line and they drop these flares and on the flare would light up the the whole countryside god i was i was just shaking up there and i was trying to sleep and and then they'd call up from headquarters hey smitty in fact first they didn't even know my name <laughs> and they would say hey uh, there's an attack tomorrow morning so we were all up on the hill the next morning waiting and if there was an attack it was up to me to phone back to the 12 guns to fire on the enemy i didn't even know whether i could do that i had no experience and what was your role at that time at why were they sending you ahead into these holes I, I don't know why they well i was just a second lieutenant but i mean what was your what was the purpose of um i was I was the eyes right. for the artillery, right. and the artillery is there to support the infantry. Mm -hmm. So that if a, uh, if I spotted a, a German machine gun, I would try to fire. You know, I, mm -hmm. they'd fire a shell, and I would say, "You're you're a hundred yards over. Mm -hmm. You're fifty yards to the right," and I would try to to land right in on it. And if there was a tank attack, then it was, that was my baby. I had to, because the infantry are going to stop those tanks. I had to, and I didn't know from nothing. You learned. Easter Sunday, they jumped off, and they succeeded. And, and uh, all those days that I was up there looking out and seeing no Germans, now all of a sudden there were Germans all over, prisoners. Where did the war take you next? Oh, well, we, we finished up in Africa. Mm -hmm. Mostly the Brits finished up in Africa. But we did our share. We were learning. Mm -hmm. We were learning. And, and when the North African campaign ended, somehow or other, we had the idea that, you know, we did our duty. We served. Now, we should go home and somebody else should take our place. So on the 4th of July, we were in a desolate camp in North Africa and uh, our commanding officer gonna give a 4th of July speech, you know. He, he was out of it, he, he was too old, he should have never been our commander, you know. So we, st we got all the soldiers lined up in the field at attention they're all expecting this good news. So this general steps up to the mic and he starts out with that rah-rah stuff, you know. You did a wonderful job. You beat the enemy. And personally, I felt that we got our butts kicked in, mm -hmm. in North Africa. But he goes through that. All right, we'll take that. And then he starts with, and we're going to continue the war, and we're going to go on and beat the Huns until we march down the streets of Wilhelmstrasse in Berlin. And he stopped. He stopped because there was a general murmur, yeah. like anger. Yeah. All those men there, and they start milling around. Instead of standing at attention in ranks, they start milling around. And, and this general was up there as if to say, uh, you, know, you know, what did I say? What did I say? Well, we, we got order, we, the officers, because it appeared now that we're going home someday in a box. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Germans were tough enemies, mm -hmm. and we had a tough time. And if it's going to be like this to the end of the war, we're not going to. We're not going to last. So we officers went back into the ranks, and we got those men to line up again. So that, that ended that. You know what they did? They promoted that general and sent him home. Oh. And we got a new commanding officer. You wouldn't believe it. He was 26 years old, graduate of West, West Point. Point. But at least... You know, he knew our feelings, and he was with it. So next we went to Sicily, mm -hmm. and here we had George Patton. Uh. I ran into Patton. Oh, you've got to tell me about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, you, you, have, you have all kinds of soldiers in your unit, 
And when you, you know, you have some obstinate soldiers who don't want to be there and don't want to cooperate. Now, when, when you get them in a war condition, you know, what are you going to do to them? You're going to take away the weekend pass? They don't get no weekend pass. You're going to take away any trip they're going to have? They don't get no trip. No one have. You're going to put them in a stockade? Then they don't have to fight. So we had a system. We had four officers. And uh, what we did is we zeroed in on that guy. The, the, the soldiers would be lined up here and you're going to inspect their guns. Well, I'd step in front of this one guy and just a, just a cursory mm -hmm. look at his gun, but I'd step in front of the guy we were after. And I'd spend 10 minutes standing in front of him, looking him over, your shoes are dirty, your leggings aren't done right, let me see that rifle. I'd put my finger inside the bolt, come out with a little bit of oil, you know, stand in front of him, stare him down because if he gets away with it the other guys are going to see it and then there were some guys that you just couldn't make change hmm. and that's what leads to General Patton you don't know this but General Patton was a sticker for a uniform he even wanted this to wear ties and we we had this kid and he kept bugging me he wanted to go with me See, I was the I was the action guy. They were back at the guns, but I was out front. All the time I was out front, near where the infantry was, or on a mountainside or something. So he kept bugging me, he wanted to go with me. So finally I, I took him, and he was, he was brave to the extreme. I, I used to tell him, Maria, if you, if you want to get yourself killed, go ahead, but you're going to get us all killed. Anyway, it was a bad night. We were rushing and running around, no sleep, and we were coming back in a Jeep. And he had his shirt open, his leggings off, no helmet on his head. And up over the rise of the road, I see this, this command car coming with four stars <laughs> on it. You know, he patent had it up in a big sign. And uh, of course, I, we stopped the Jeep all jumped out and stood at attention, but not this Maria. He crawled out of the Jeep, turned around and started walking away. Well, Patton stands up in his command car screaming, get that soldier's name, who is this officer? And this Maria just keeps on strolling away. And when they say, who is his officer? He points at me. So General Patton didn't come running down, but he sent his aide. Yeah. His aide was a reasonable guy, you know, and I, he came over to me, he took my name, yeah. but I said, we, we had a bad night last night, and I'm sorry, but uh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. So he went back and he talked a few words to Patton, and Patton sat down. You, you, you might find Patton anywhere. Yeah. He, he went all over the place, but uh, I met him. I had a reply by endorsement, which means I had to write something that I'm sorry it happened and it would never happen again. Why did the guy walk away? So is that he, I, you know, Pat drove away and I went down to Maria. Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to hit anybody, <laughs> but I stood in front of him and I started screaming yeah. and he, he just shuffled his shoulder. He says, he, he, I know, you know, you know that everybody hates him. <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't like Patton too much, I'll tell you that. But I ran into Patton. And we had uh, other adventures too. Yeah. We, uh, I, was, I was up on top of a hill and there was a little village down below. And the, the, off, the infantry officer, I would support the infantry. Yeah. So I was with the infantry officer and he looks down in this village and he says, I see a gun down there, a, tilly, a German gun. I looked down in the village, the center of the village. I wasn't sure whether that was a gun or not. So he said, I want it neutralized. I want it fired on. So I called for fire and the shell landed in the village and shook this so-called gun. And then I knew it wasn't a gun. 
You know, when you draw water from a well, you have a long oh, stick, see, yeah. and it comes to a, a, like almost a point. Mm -hmm. And from where my distance, I couldn't see whether there was a pail on it. All I saw was a gun. And when my shell landed, there was dust flew, and I saw that gun shake, and I knew it wasn't a gun. Well, the captain, the infantry captain says, I want you to fire on that. Now, 12 guns were ready to unload on that little village. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I remember thinking later on, I played God. I just didn't do it. Yeah. And, and uh, he got distracted. The infantry captain got distracted and forgot all about it. My guns were all loaded, ready to blow that poor village to kingdom come. But we held off. Was that Sicily? That was in Sicily. And after Sicily, where did you go? That, then we, we went into another one of those camps. Yeah. Oh, camps. Like when Africa ended, we were in a camp. Mm -hmm. And each day, you uh, had a wreck trip, a recreation trip to a big city. Mm -hmm. So you would load up a truck and take about 15 soldiers in your truck. Mm -hmm. Now this, this duty was handed to second lieutenants, which was not a very pleasant duty, because that wound up to be a, an all-day drunk. The soldiers would go to the town, have, have the best time they could. They would look for girls, but usually they weren't that successful, but they drank. Then, then in that little town that, that you took them to, well, it was a big town, and by their standards, like a place like called Messina, mm -hmm. there wasn't much there, but yeah. that was the big town. Then at four o'clock, you had to get them out of there. Mm -hmm. So at four o'clock, I'd be, when, when we got there, I would give them a big lecture, you know. You better back back here by four. If you're not back by four, we're gonna leave you. And if we're not back by four, the next day trip, will be canceled. Well, I didn't want to be the one that caused the trips to cancel. So I uh, got there at four o'clock, I'm waiting. And uh, maybe uh, they'd, they'd all come staggering up to the truck ready to go, and there'd be some guys missing. So I would stand there, maybe I had nine of them here and three of them not there. Now what am I gonna do? If I go back, I'll lose the nine. So I had to look look at the guys standing there and see which was a little more sober than the others <laughs> and send them in. Yeah. And then get them all back. Uh, it was a, a lovely trip. But that, at, at the end of Sicily, we were in a camp like that. Mm -hmm. Then we went across on a barge to the toe of Italy mm -hmm. and drove up and joined the fighting in Italy. And that's where we stayed. Where did you fight in Italy? Well, the, the, the area of the Italian war that got all the publicity was Casino. Mm -hmm. And we were just, I was in the sector next to Casino. Mm -hmm. I saw the Abbey bomb. Oh, yeah. I saw it. Saw the bombs drop right on that abbey, mm -hmm. and, and you think, boy, that destroyed it. Did not. In, in Italy, they had very little wood, mm -hmm. and every building was made of uh, cement, mortar, mm -hmm. and stones. And when, you, and when you bomb that, you create rubble. Mm -hmm. And rubble is, is easier to defend than a building. So you, you bombed a little village, a casino, and knocked the buildings down, but you created all this rubble, mm -hmm. and the enemy stayed behind the rubble. Mm -hmm. And now you don't even have anything to aim at, because he could be anywhere in that rubble. Mm -hmm. So the bombing of the abbey, I, I remember some of the walls were still standing, and if the Germans used the abbey, uh, they could still use it. But I, I wouldn't be able to say because we were just in the next sector. See, they divide the front into sectors. 
and uh, we were in the northern sector, but we, there was a mountain in the northern section, and that's where I earned the Bronze Star Medal. Can, do you mind if we just put this on no. camera and tell me how you uh, earned that medal? Well, there was a furious battle for this mountaintop. Yeah. A worthless mountain, really, but it was a mountain. And what's no, the, where was, was this? It was a mountain in Italy, and it was to mm -hmm. the north of Casino. Mm -hmm. And uh, for four days, the battle swung back and forth, and I was on a adjacent hill, and I could see everything. So they depended on me for all the information, and I called for all kinds of fire on the enemy, you had to be very careful, because when you, when they get, when they're fighting that close to one another, you know, you don't want your shells mm -hmm. to ever land in amongst your soldiers. Right. So you got to be very careful. And uh, I stayed there for about four days, and I read an account put out by the government, and they say that 400 American soldiers were either killed or wounded mm -hmm. on that four-day battle for that mountaintop. Mm -hmm. And I was, and I don't know how many the Germans lost, I don't know. And, and uh, the dead, I don't know whether you ever heard of this, but uh, if you leave a soldier lie there, dead soldier lie there in warm weather, you know what happens to him? He blows up, mm -hmm. face gets blown up, body blows up, all the buttons come mm -hmm. off his shirt. But you know what holds? His belt. Makes, it, makes the soldier look like a balloon. Mm -hmm. And animals do the same thing. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, the dead was always treated with reverence, even by the Germans. Mm -hmm. You know, Germans were retreating and a soldier would die, and the Germans wouldn't have enough time to put him in a proper, they had their little, mm -hmm. they had their little cemeteries, yeah. but they didn't have time. So they would bury their dead, take a rifle, turn it upside down, and stick it in to mark the spot, mm -hmm. hang his dog tags, you know what dog tags oh, are? Sure. Mm -hmm. Hang his dog tags on him, mm -hmm. and they would expect us to do the right thing, oh. and we did. We had a, a German cemetery, and we had our own cemetery. Mm. But you would think, here's a dead soldier. How you're going to carry him off a mountain? Mm. That's hard to do, yeah. and he's dead. So you would think they would just uh, take his body and yeah. throw it down the mountain. But no, sir. I noticed you also uh, have a Purple Heart. Yeah. Could you tell me? Okay. Just, just show it on camera for a little while. It was in a, yeah, I was good. in a jeep yeah. with my captain, yeah. and we came down a road, and uh, I don't know where this German tank came from, but he hit our jeep with a shell. Now, a, f uh, a second, and he and the shell would have landed on the hood and uh, we'd have both been dead. But the shell landed a little, and literally went under the Jeep, and all the explosion was absorbed by the Jeep. Now, what we did throughout the whole war is loaded the whole floor of the Jeeps and trucks with sandbags. That was to prevent running over a mine and, or any kind of explosion like this so that most of the shell's explosion went into the sandbags. I got hit in the leg, mm -hmm. missed the bone. Mm -hmm. I got a slice here, missed anything vital. I had a slice here. Mm -hmm. Now that slice here, if it had been a little bit over, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have made it. And then I got the slice here, and that's the one that, and I'll tell you this, we, we, we ran. I, I pushed the captain. He was, when the explosion took place, you know, it's, it's like your head. 
and I started the blackout, and then I all of a sudden reached a point where I didn't. I came to, and the captain was sitting next to me, and he was, I started, I yelled, get out! And he, he looked at me, and he said, Smitty, what's wrong? He was, I pushed him out the jeep. We wanted to go this way, because I felt that the tank was over that way. We pushed out, and we ran up a path, and ran into a German dugout. Now, I, somebody could say, God helped us, because we had no idea there was a dugout there. And I was in the dugout, and they fired about eight more shells, and uh, you know they were very close to the dugout, but they couldn't get us in the dugout. And so my the captain that was with me, and two other guys appeared, two other American soldiers, and they tore the door off the dugout and made it a stretcher. But I didn't want to go. I said, I want to stay here till it's dark. No, they said, you're bleeding, you got to get out. And then I started to go into shock. You know what shock is? Shock is when you realize how close you came to something terrible happening. It doesn't have to be war, it could be anything. So they laid me on the door and carried me out. And, and there we are walking that path that the Germans had just fired on. And I believe that that German officer saw the bravery that was to save me, and he never fired. Mm -hmm. And we went down to the, where the jeep, my jeep was sitting there all smashed, and got in another jeep and drove away. When I got to the top of the hill and started down, I began to feel happy. I realized I, I don't know about my hand, I couldn't feel in my thumb, but I realized I had all my faculties, and I had ran on my legs. So inside I began to say to myself, you're out of it. <laughs> you're out of it. You're gonna go home. That's how I felt. And then, then I, we were in the French sector, so I went to a French hospital, then they took me to American hospital. When I arrived at the American hospital, you know, when you have an offense, when you attack, and what they do is they, they clean the hospital out. They get all the soldiers they can possibly get out of beds, because they want empty beds. And I went into this big operating tent. You wouldn't believe it. <laughs> there must have been 10 to 12 uh, teams of uh, doctors and nurses all over the place. In other words, you go in and they have an operation, you know, they have the operation table and all the things around it. Well, there were 10 or 12 of them, and each team was ready to take uh, wounded soldiers. Mm -hmm. And so they rushed me in there, and then I started to worry because, you know, why, why are they rushing me? I'm all right, what's this hurry? I thought, you know, I thought maybe I had made a mistake and maybe there was a danger. And then when I came to on a cot in, in, a, in the hospital, I started struggling because I couldn't move right. Then I began to worry there was something seriously wrong with me. But what they had done is they, they put a cast here down to here. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and before I went into the operating room, I knew my arm wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. And then they had a cast from, from way up on my leg down to my ankle. So then I thought, my God, so maybe I'm not going to be all right. But they finally told me that uh, by immobilizing the wound, why uh, it'll heal faster. Uh, a lot of things happen. Did you hear about the war in other areas what, during the war well, in the Pacific? sort of, sort yeah. of. And how did you hear about the war? Well, we, uh, I mean, the Japanese war. Yes. Well, I, I didn't, uh, I don't hear, I don't remember hearing very much about the Japanese war, but I almost was sent over to that, too. Really? Yeah. 
I was uh, in the hospital. So. You people may wonder, you know, how come all this stuff's happened to me? Because I haven't told you a whole lot of other things that happened. But I, uh, I was at, uh, I was sent on an army post finally when I recovered. And on the army post, I would go into the hospital every day and treat it. What they tried to do is, by electrical shock, have these muscles working so that when the nerve healed and the arm and the hand was ready to work, the muscles were loose. So I used to go every, and I got bored on the army post. So I heard that. Uh, it was a new program uh, in the war in the Pacific. The soldiers are going to be on the ship for an awful long time. Mm -hmm. And so they were going to send recreation officers mm -hmm. who were going to run a newspaper, uh, have music all day long, mm -hmm. show movies, mm -hmm. entertain, yeah. organize it. And they were asking for officers, and they were asking for officers who had been in combat before. So I signed up for it, yeah. as I was assured that I would not have to get off that ship right. and go in on some kind of crazy landing. Because, yeah. you know, you can be lucky once, <laughs> but to try to be lucky again, yeah. you're not going to make it. So I uh, went into that program. And I went to Washington and Lee University, where we were given instructions. And you know who our teachers were? Who? Movie stars. You're kidding. Movie stars. Of course, we had technicians that showed us yeah. how to run films and stuff right. like that. But they, they said, you'll, on a ship like that, you'll never be able to organize a play or anything. Yeah. But you could organize these little skits. And then they would put on a little skit, you know, like, the guy would stand in front of the mic, he would say, uh, here's your situation. Uh, uh, you're uh, trying to pick up this girl, and she uh, is waiting for her boyfriend. And you'd step on a little stage, and you'd act it out. You'd ab lib the whole thing. Some guys were very good at that, but I went into that training. And then the place where I was going to go uh, to actually aboard a ship yeah. was up here, Army Base in Boston. Yeah. So I, well, we had three choices when we got out of that school. New York City, which everybody wanted. Yeah. Hampton News, Virginia, which nobody wanted. And then Boston. So I figured if I put in for New York and don't get it, I'll wind up in Virginia. Yeah. So if I take Boston as my first choice, I might get it, and I got it. So I came up here to the Army Post, Army Base. Off, I think it's off a of North or South Station, I forget. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in a building owned by Robux. You know Sears and Robux? Yes. Robux owned a big building which was facing the Boston Garden. And he turned it over to the Army to use. Mm -hmm. So I was there, and uh, you know, I wanted to ride a subway. I wanted to go around to Boston. These other guys were content to stay in that building and drink and get drunk. <laughs> I wanted to see Boston, so I started out at night and I started across the, the garden. Then I went up to the Commons. And when I got up on what is Tremont Street, I noticed all these soldiers and sailors walking up Tremont Street. So, so I started up to see what's going on. And I went over the old South Church there, you know, mm -hmm. and I came down on the other side, and I ran into this area, which was alive. All lights, bars open, <laughs> women, girls dancing on the bar, music, you and know, where the, I was. And what was the name of that neighborhood? Scully Square, <laughs> the old Howard, and there were some others there. Oh, man. <laughs> I, then I went back, you know, to sleep that night, and I talked to the other guys, and we all went down there. What a lively place. <laughs> and what happened from there? Well, I, 
When I was in a hospital in Italy, uh, the doctor said to me, you know, he says, you're not cured. And if, if you were back in the States, uh, we, we, we wouldn't let you go because you have to, you need a lot of treatment to this hand, which is just yeah. hung like this. Right. And, and the more it hung, yeah. you know, the more I, <laughs> I protected it yeah. so that the whole arm became useless. So he says, we need your bed. As soon as you can walk, you're going home, and I'll give you this letter. And, and when you feel that uh, you need some help, treatment and whatnot, you just turn yourself into sick hall. Oh, that sounded good. And did that, did that ever make me learn to walk? Mm. Before that, I, you know. <laughs> now, mm. I wanted to show him. <laughs> each Saturday, they would post a list of who's going home. Mm. And each Saturday, I wouldn't make it. And so finally, I, I made it. And I got home, and then I had that letter. So when I heard about these kamikaze planes, you know, dive bombing at the mm -hmm. ships going to Japan, and they assured me I wouldn't have to fight. Mm -hmm. But I don't want to be on one of the, then I put, turned myself in. So and I went to Murphy General mm -hmm. up in Waltham. You ever heard of Murphy General? No. Mm -hmm. And then I came to Cushy, and there I met my wife. Oh. I never went home. <laughs> never looked at another girl after I met her. No more trips to Scully Square? No more trips to Scully Square. <laughs> when were you discharged? I was, I was discharged, uh, I think, April of 45 or 46, I don't know. And where were you discharged from? Uh, uh, Fort Devens. Fort Devens. Yeah. I, and I faced the situation, you know. If I go home now, oh yes, yeah, she's going to write to me, but nothing's going to come of this. Yeah. And so I had to make up my mind to stay up here. And I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anyone at all. I'd never been up here. But I took a chance. And I, it was at Cushing Hospital, and the guy next to me was a head case. He'd been hit in the head. Mm -hmm. And his whole one side was, was paralyzed. So he said, uh, you know, he says, I live in Dorchester. And Dorchester didn't mean nothing to me. Mm -hmm. But he says, we got an attic room. My mother, all the family's gone, and my mother will rent it to you. About, uh, about $8 a week. So I went there. But Dorchester, coming all the way to South Station, to get a train, to go all the way to Framingham, oh. it's too much. It's too much. So, and then I got a little room in Boston on one of those streets there, I forget what the name, a little bitty room. And my wife, we weren't married yet, but when she came in to see my little room, she said, you live here? Oh, it was a <laughs> quarter the size of this. It just had a bed, but I stayed there. And I worked, got a job. What was your I job? And I keep coming out, oh, I had an idea of becoming a owning a restaurant or working, managing a restaurant. So I went into training for that. But later on, I went back to school. I went to BU, BC, mm -hmm. graduate school, and got a degree for teaching. Excellent. And, and what did you teach? And we got married, and then the kids came. What did you teach? Oh, I taught all kinds of subjects at junior high, but junior high. qualified for social studies. Yeah. Excellent. How, when you returned from the war, how do you feel the community I, treated you as I, a veteran? I, I never asked for nothing. Yeah. A lot of, many, many soldiers, when they got out of the service, went right for uh, uh, unemployment. I never, I never collected a dime. I went right to work. I didn't think the country owed me anything. I was almost retired as an officer, and there was a committee of, of, of doctors in the room when I went to be retired. And I would have been retired on a good pay. I probably wouldn't have had to work the rest of my life. I was going to be so good. But they, they uh, you know, they humiliated me. You know, they said, uh, give me a pencil. And they said, uh, 
write. I, I, I could hold a pencil like this, mm. but I couldn't hold it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't write, mm. but I picked up the pencil and I said, I can write. I wrote with my left hand, mm. and I wrote. To this day, I can write with my oh. left hand. So then they said, uh, pick up this chair. And uh, First with my good hand, I had a terrible time. They want me to pick it up by one, one, one mm -hmm. and uh, then they would said, take it to this chair. I couldn't, I couldn't do nothing. Mm -hmm. Just fell down. And and finally, uh, you know, they implied that I was faking. It. I got so damn mad. I says, I don't want this. I don't want. I don't want to be retired. I don't want anything from you people at all. And I marched right out. It's the best thing I ever did. Because then I had to do it. Mm. Then I had to, I had to work, and I had to use this hand, mm. and the hand came back. At one time, it, at one time, it was, all the skin came off my hand. Mm. It was red. It was a sad sight. Mm. How would you say overall, serving in the military affected the rest of your life? Oh, I met my wife. <laughs> That's. Yeah. That's a, that was a big thing. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to serve. I really wanted to serve. I really thought that we were right. Mm. I really thought that, uh, of course, I had a glorious view of what war would be like. But uh, uh, I, I was really fighting for my country. Mm. I really served, and I was a good soldier. Mm. I didn't do, I, I used to sit up on a mountain and figure out, you know, uh, they leave me up here all alone. Suppose a German patrol comes up, you know, what am I going to do? Shoot at them? I wasn't a very good shot. And I'm all alone. Run? Well, I ran one night when I thought I heard some noise. But in the main, as I wrote in my story, no hero here. <laughs> I'm going to come out and, uh, Go into a prison camp if I have to. Mm -hmm. I never touched, you know, there were souvenir hunters. Guys would go along and take a German watch off the dead. Uh, mm -hmm. You know why I never touched it? If a German patrol catches me and I got a German watch on, you know, they're mad at you anyway and they have, they have total power over you. They can kill you if they want. They can kill you. They don't even have to take your prison. So I don't want any souvenirs on me. Mm. No, sir. Well. How do you feel about the difference in the public opinion between the way World War II veterans mm. were treated and, um, and Vietnam veterans when they returned well, home? See, World War II was a popular war, a necessary war. Now, Vietnam, I don't know what is necessary, but I don't agree with soldiers running off to Canada either. I don't ever agree with Clinton. Uh, if, if your country deems it necessary, and this is not a war country, we're not war lovers like Germany, then uh, I think you've got a duty to go. So I think the soldiers should have served. But it's just too bad that they served in an unpopular war and are not getting the credit mm. that, that they deserve. Because they served, and uh, that was, that was a, maybe in some ways a worse war than, than uh, we had. As we wind down this interview, yeah. I wanted to ask you, is there any thought or memory you'd like to share with, your, with the community or with future generations? Well, I believe that we, we used to talk before we went overseas and even while traveling there. Mm -hmm. how, how are you going to behave under war condition? Are you going to cry? Mm -hmm. I saw guys cry. Mm -hmm. Are you going to run? How, how are you going to behave? Mm -hmm. So my message would be that most responsible people will fight mm -hmm. and will serve and serve well. 
Okay. Today. Thank you so much for a wonderful <laughs> interview. I wish I had uh, the time and energy to, to have a six-hour interview, but I am going to close it up now, and I want to thank you so okay. much for your time, for your memories. Okay. I enjoyed telling it, because uh, not too many people want to listen to war stories. <laughs>